السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم اعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا لعب ولهو وزينة وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر في الأموال والأولاد كمثل غيث أعجب الكفار نباته ثم يهيج فتراه مصفرا ثم يكون حطاما وفي الآخرة عذاب شديد ومغفرة من الله ورضوان وما الحياة الدنيا إلا متاع الغرور رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب العالمين If I can accomplish in the next 20 or less minutes sharing with you some lessons from just one ayah of the Quran I think I've done my job This is an ayah that belongs to Surah Al-Hadid Wait, hold on. He wants to go that way. And he's crying, and you brought him to the stage. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. All right. What was I talking about? How many ayat am I going to talk about? Just one. Belongs to Surah Al Hadid, Surah number 57 of the Quran, which is a Madani Surah, which means that the predominant subject of the Surah is addressing the Muslim community. There are surahs of the Qur'an that are madani in which predominantly the subject matter is addressing all of humanity because it was an invitation to all of humanity. But then there are places in the Qur'an, especially in madani Qur'an, where the, the Muslim community is the primary audience. They're the ones listening. You can't hear me? I'm sorry. That's all I can do. Okay. So now, in this madani surah, what Allah Azza wa Jal gives us is a summary of the things we run after in life. And he begins by saying, I'lamu, you had better know. You had better know. It's a commandment from Allah for something for us to realize. But the things he says are really obvious. But perhaps there are things that we don't take into consideration when living out our lives. He says, I'lamu annamal hayatu dunya la'ib. Worldly life amounts to nothing more than play. I didn't understand this ayah properly enough until I became a father myself. As our children are growing up, there are needs and there are wants. We all know that. And our children, when they're born, all they have are needs. They need to drink their milk, they need to poop, they need to get some sleep, and the cycle begins again. But as they get a little bit bigger, a want comes into play. My child who's six months old, nine months old, a year old, they really want to play. They want to be held, thrown up and down, tickled. They can't just sit there and eat food and go to sleep. They want, to mess, they want to play peekaboo. They want to play. It's a desire naturally that comes into a child. I used to, I remember like a, a, a crazy incident that reminded me of this ayah. There's a place in America that every sister here knows about. It's almost a religious obligation on Muslim sisters to go once a week to Target. Right? So I was fulfilling my religious obligation, taking my family to Target. And I was in charge of our, at that time, you know, our first son, Walid or Imad rather, I forget names all the time now. I just call him number three, what are you, number four, sorry, four, come here, you know? So anyway, Imad was like two years old at the time. And you know boys, when you take them to the grocery store, they just wanna knock everything over in the aisle because it's really entertaining for them to watch you pick it up and put it back. So I need to keep him busy. So I go to the toy section and there's this giant ball, huge, it's bigger than him. So I take it out and I say, you do this, son. So he takes the thing, he kicks it. And he goes over a little bit more and he kicks it. And he goes over a little, and he did tawaf of the entire target this way. It was awesome. I didn't have to do anything. I just had to follow him around. And he's getting exhausted. He's sweating. The diaper is starting to smell suspicious. But he's still, and he kicks it one more time and he falls to the floor. He's just sitting on his bottom like this. And he's staring at the ball. And he's breathing heavy like, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> you know, and he gets up and he goes and he's about to kick it again until my wife found out and she picked him up. And she said, what are you doing? And he, he goes in her arms, passes out the second he gets in her arms. Because the most important thing to him at that point was what? Play. It's a phase we go through in life. But then a new problem is added to our lifestyle. Allah says, اِعْلَمُوا أَنَّمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا لَعِبٌ وَلَهْوٌ and, and things that are pastimes, 
Lahu is actually used for things that aren't technically useful, but they are entertaining. They're entertaining and they get your mind off of work. That's called lehu, technically. Our children get a little older and it's not just games. It's not just, you know, pick abu and, you know, let's play tag or hide and seek. Now you want to add something more and we call that entertainment. Tell me a story, Abba. Hey, can I watch some, can I watch the show? Can I watch Sesame Street? We watch Sesame Street. It's okay, I have a fatwa. But anyway, so, you know, can I watch Sesame Street? Can we watch this? Can we watch that? Can you tell me a story? Now that's not playing. What is that? That's entertainment. It's the next phase. It's a new desire that's been added to the arsenal. And of course that entertainment and game playing and entertainment com combined together is now the new video game industry, right? There are stories and there are gameplay that are combined together. And of course the biggest consumers of those things are children. And of course, the you know, huge consumers within the Muslim community are children that are buying video games that are way, below, way above their age level. So NC17 video game, your eight-year-old is coming to you and telling you, Mama, I really need to get Grand Theft Auto for Eid. And if you just get me this one video game, we will be among the righteous if you just get this one game for me. I promise, I'll, I'll fast every day, etc., etc. So now there was games, and there was entertainment. Allah adds a third dimension, wazinatun, and beautification, beauty itself. Tazyeen actually means beautification. Zina means beauty itself. Beauty itself becomes an obsession. You know what that means? That means puberty hits. That means you become a teenager. That means you start seeing, become really obsessed with how you look. When you were 10 years old, nine years old, you didn't care if your shoes didn't match. You didn't care how you got dressed. You didn't care how anybody else dressed. But now that you're 13 years old, sister, you spend 45 minutes in front of a mirror fixing your hijab. And one side of your hijab is higher than the other. And you're slapping your head as hard as you can. And it's not going down. And your mother's knocking on the door saying, is everything okay? Yes, mom, it's okay. Etc. And then on the other side you have guys, they can't grow facial hair, but they really think they can. So they're staring really hard in the mirror. It's coming, it's coming. Oh, I see one. Right? And then there's the guys that have the whole beard, but they want to make the perfect pencil. You see those things? It's a work of art. It's so fine. Work of engineering. And they'll spend a lot of time doing that. Even the guy that's like shaved his head and he's bald is checking himself out in the mirror, going like this. I've seen young men walk to the masjid. They're walking to the masjid for Jumu'ah and they stop and check themselves out in every car's reflection. <laughs> it is so entertaining. Especially if you're sitting in the car and they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's really a lot of fun. But anyway, zina, beautification, it becomes an obsession. You just want, you want to look beautiful. You want, you're attracted to others that are beautiful. You want to be in a beautiful looking car. You don't invite people to your house if you don't think it looks beautiful. If your dad drives one of these old busted Chevys or something, you ask him to drop you off three blocks before the high school. You would rather walk it rather than be seen in that thing, right? Because you're obsessed with beauty, with fashion, with clothes, with interior design. You start decorating your room at that age. You start to, you know, you want to get a car. You want to get a nice looking phone. You don't care if it's functioning well or not. You want a nice looking phone. And then you want a nice cover on it too. This is Zina. It's an age you go through. And then this passes too. Because if you see a, a point comes, you become college students. High school age passes, you're college students now. You'll notice college students look like homeless people a lot of times. Right, the hair's all over the place. They don't brush their teeth, they show up to class just sitting there in t-shirt and pajamas or whatever, they just roll out of bed and go to class. They don't care. All they care about is graduating, really serious students. All they care about is the GPA, you know, and the, you know, the internship or whatever else, right? And why do they care about that? Because a new desire has now taken place. And I'm not saying that the previous desires disappear. What were the previous desires in order? Can you tell me? What was number one? Playing. What was number two? Entertainment. What was number three? Beauty. 
Here's number four, showing off to each other. بَيْنَكُمْ You want to be able to tell someone you mean something. So you go, somebody comes over to you and they're asking you for directions to the convention and you're like, yeah, and I study at NYU. I, I just need to know where the convention center is. Med school, actually. <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> You just get your job, you get your first job, and they offer you a, you know, a job ID, like you, maybe you, jo you got a job at a prestigious company, I don't know, Walmart or something. But you know, you get your job and they give you your badge and you stick it out. You make sure you stick it out so people see, oh, you work there? Oh, it's, yeah, yeah, they give, you, give me a parking, lot, parking spot in the parking lot. I took a picture of it, here, check it out. You know, there's a pride. You wanna show people what you've accomplished. When people graduate, what do they get? They get a diploma, and what do they do with their diploma? They stick it in a drawer somewhere where nobody will see it? What do they do? They put it up on the wall. So people walk in and they see it. It's your pride. You want to show people what you've done. People take a picture with a famous person and they want to show others. Hey, look, look, look at that, look at that. I, honest to God, I feel like a statue sometimes at this convention. People come over, brother, come here, I need a picture with you. The guy doesn't even say salam, man. He doesn't have a picture with you. And I get scared, like, okay, don't hurt me. You can take a picture. <laughs> but anyhow, so now we're at the point where your desire is to show people what school you go to, how, where you graduated from, what job you have, your first apartment, your first car. A car is about showing people what you got. Right? You, want, you have that innate desire, and Allah put that in us. There's something in us. And people want to, especially young people, they're coming out of the cocoon. They're not under their family anymore. So now they want to show the fact that they're grown adults and they're living on their own. So it somehow comes up that they have their own apartment, even if nobody asked. It just comes up, because they're really proud of the fact that they're living on their own. Oh, they're really proud of the fact that they leased their first car or something. And it just kind of slips up, and it comes up, even though nobody's interested. Right? That, so, so now this tafakhurum baynakum is added to the mix. You, you still really like games, you still like entertainment, you still have a sense of beautifying yourself and being attracted to beauty, but now add to that you want to show yourself to others. And then even that age passes, you stop, you get married, you have kids. And once you have, and how many people here have kids? Okay, now you know what I'm talking about. All you can think about is what? The kids, that's all you can think about. What they need. Do we have groceries enough for breakfast tomorrow? Is, are their uniforms ready for school? What is the, some, you know, when is summer vacation starting? Where, we can't live in this apartment anymore, we need to move into a house because there's too many kids now and we don't have space anymore. The bills, you know, the clothes, the changing shoe sizes constantly. The hand-me-downs aren't working anymore, you know. Because your son is refusing to wear the pink sneakers his older sister wore once, you know, etc. So you have to buy new ones now. But now there's a mutually shared concern about making money and stabilizing your wealth for yourself and your children. So you're constantly checking the bank account. You have the mobile app and you log in every few hours and check. It's still there? Let me check again. It's still there. Okay. All right. It's still there. Oh, wait, it went down a little bit. Oh my God. Automatically the gas company took out the money. And it burns every time you see that minus. You're like, ah, you know. Allah says, وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ And a mutually shared urge to have stability in money and stability in children. Now, so far, and by the way, as you get to that age, when you worry about money so much and a house and savings and retirement account and all this other, or college savings for your kids, young people that are still in the earlier stages of desire, earlier stages are what? Playing, entertainment. You talk to them about savings, they're like, I don't care about savings. What are you talking about? I'll never be like my parents. I don't care about a house. I don't care about this or that. And talk to me in 20 years. You will go through the same cycle that so many thousands and millions before you have gone. Generation after generation after generation. Allah summarizes the things we run after that we think will make us happy. That we think will make us happy. Here's all of it. A child thinks they'll be happy when they play. A little older when they get entertained. A little older when they feel beautiful and they get something beautiful and around them things are beautiful. A little older when they can show off that they've accomplished something. And a little older when they feel like they have financial stability. People around the world, doesn't matter what religion they have, 
when they buy a house, they look back and they say, I've accomplished something. And if they haven't bought a house, you ask them, what do you want, man? I wish I owned a property. I wish I owned, you know, they drive by, they live in an apartment, they're driving by a nice house, even a small house, and their eyes can't help but go. And the mind wander, wonders, man, if I, was, I had a place like that, that'd be nice. Oh, that'd be pretty nice. You know, you can't help yourself but go to real estate websites and check out houses. You know, you're thinking about moving to another city. You've got three, four years before you can even move, but you're already looking at houses and pictures. And you're calling the wife and saying, hey, look at this one. Look at the bedrooms in this one. Wow, look at the outside of this one. And you can't help yourself. You're in that, this is something Allah put inside you. Now, this is half the ayah, which is good because I reached half my time. This is half the ayah. In this half, Allah just describes what are the things you and I are running after that we share. In the second half, Allah compares it to something. And I hope you can pay close attention. I know the sound system's got a lot of echo. I hope you can pay attention to the second part because this is where the guidance is from Allah Azza wa on these pursuits of happiness. This is where the guidance is. He says, كَمَثَلِ غَيْثٍ أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارَ نَبَاتُهُ It is like heavy rain. Now the word for Arabic, in Arabic for rain is matar. Matar is rain. Ghayth means perfect rain. It's not so much that the land would flood, and it's not so little that the, the plants won't grow. It is perfect in quantity. That kind of rain is called ghayth. That is why when we ask Allah for rain, we make the salat of istighatha. Istighatha. Why? Because we're asking not just for any kind of rain, we're asking for ghayth. We're asking for the right kind of rain. Because the wrong kind of rain can be death. It can be a flood. It can kill you. It could, you could rain, Allah can rain fire, stones from the sky too. You want ghayf, rain that brings life. So Allah says the example of the things you run after is like perfect rain. The farmer who planted the seed in the ground is so happy because of the produce of that rain. Now there's an image here. The farmer in this ayah is called, or the farmers are called kufar. Now you know what kufar means in your general vocabulary. What does kafir mean? Unbeliever, disbeliever, not in this ayah. In this ayah of Surah Al-Hadid, kufar are the people who bury seeds in the ground. That's what the literal meaning of kufar is. People who bury seeds in the ground. A kafir buries the truth inside himself. That's why he's called a kafir. Anyhow, farmers do a lot of things in the year. But what's the first thing they have to do? Plant the seed. That's the first thing. Then later on, they have to take care of the soil. They have to make sure it gets enough water. They have to make sure it doesn't get infested or infected. They have to do all and make sure it gets enough sun. All of these things. But the first thing they have to do and the hardest part of their work is when they are kuffar, when they are planting the seed. Allah refers to that. Why? Because that is the hardest work and that is when you don't see any fruits of your labor. You don't know if these seeds are good or not. You don't know if the insects will come and eat everything or not. You don't even know if it's gonna rain or not. You don't know anything. And unlike you and me, I refer to this all the time, if you have a job, you get a paycheck twice a week. Or maybe uh, twice a month, right? Twice a month, you get a paycheck. Or maybe weekly. How many times does a farmer get paid? Once a year. Once in an entire year. He has to work the entire year and then he gets the fruits of his labor? Maybe. Maybe. He has to work for sure, he may or may not get. Now the guy goes to sleep after stressful weeks and weeks of planting seeds in the ground. And he goes to sleep and he wakes up one day and he looks out his window and it's perfect rain. Is he happy? He's happy, huh? And he, start, he starts seeing in a field of brown, he starts seeing little dots of green. They're not full grown plants yet. When the farm matures, the stalks are so high, they're taller than him. But right now, it's just little tiny dots of green. But even that is making him super happy. He's super happy. Then Allah says, Thumma yahiju. Then that plant matures. When it matures, I told you, it's even taller than him. Now when a plant matures, what is the next logical step for a farmer? I know you guys aren't farmers. Maybe some of you are, I don't know. Any people from Ohio in the house? I don't know. What do you do when the, when the plant reaches maturity? You crop, you harvest, you cut. That's what you're supposed to do. 
But the ayah is very strange. Allah does not say that He yahsud, that He cuts it. He actually says, فَتَرَاهُ مُصْفَرًّا You will watch it turn yellow. You will watch it turn yellow. Now this is important to understand. Any farmer who is not insane will never let his farm turn yellow. He will still cut it when it is green, when it's still fresh. When it's yellow, it's already dead. It's already on its way to death. And he says, ثُمَّ يَكُونُ حُطَامًا Then it will turn into hutam. Hutam means things that are crusty on the ground, that you pay no attention to, that you walk by and you step on them and it makes a crunchy sound, and you don't even realize you've stepped on anything worth, worth anything. Like dried up leaves. If you step on a dried up leaf, you don't think twice about it. You don't go, oh I'm sorry. You don't do that. Because you don't care, it's just you know, meaningless crust. That's all it is. Hutam is literally things that are stepped on without any consideration. Allah says in this example, this is the example for you and me to understand our life. I haven't explained the example yet. I've only walked you through its pieces. I have 58 seconds? Can I have five more minutes? No? Five? Yeah? Five. I promise. It's not like Imam Siraj Wahaj just five minutes. <laughs> this is... <laughs> You're not getting the mic again so I could talk like this. Alright. So I have five minutes. In these five minutes, what was the first desire? Play. Before a child gets to play, you took your child to Toys R Us. Bad idea, but you took him. You took him to Toys R Us. His eyes are looking at that toy on the shelf. He's in the cart, but his eyes are glazed. And when you change the aisle, his head turns. And his arm moves out. And he's already imagining the moment when he's what? He's holding this thing and he's playing with it and he's smashing his face into it and all kinds of fun things. He's already played it all out in his head. And he begs you, Mama, that one, that one. And so you grab Captain America and you put him in the cart. And you go to the aisle and you buy him Captain America. But you tell him, don't take it out until we get to the house. Now he's got the bag in his hand. And he's looking, he's sitting in the back car seat. He's just looking in the bag, looking in the bag. He takes it out, Mama, can I open it? No, I said no. And now he's in anticipation. Oh my God, I can't wait till, oh, it's gonna be awesome. You have to make a video of your child holding a toy that they haven't opened yet. And make sure you make it last. Because that is the happiest few minutes your child will have with that toy. It is like that farmer who is so nervous, is it gonna rain, is it gonna rain, is it gonna rain? When it rains, he's super happy. He hasn't even seen the farm crop yet. He hasn't seen it mature yet, but he's still happy. He's like, I can't wait, this is gonna be awesome. I'm gonna get paid. He's already thinking about where he's gonna spend the money, everything. So this kid is excited. And then finally he opens the toy. And he plays it with it for about a total, I'll give you three hours. Give or take three hours. Where do you find the toy after that? under the bed. Where's your toy? I don't know. You gave me, you never got me Iron Man. I only got Captain America. I never got, I, I never got Iron Man. I wanted Iron Man. In a matter of minutes, this thing that was such an object of my child's desire is now worthless. What did Allah describe as worthless? The farm. It was such a big deal to you. And when you got it, you didn't reap its benefits, it just became worthless to you. Your child asked you for Grand Theft Auto. He was crying, he was making Qiyam al -Layl. He went to the masjid on the 27th night. Ya Allah, any, this game, I need it. I promise I'll finish it within a week. I'll beat all of it, I promise. And he got it, and he beat it. And then you wake up one day and it's under your feet in the, in the kitchen. What is this CD doing here? Didn't you buy this game? Yeah, I beat it already. It was boring. It's kind of... The last one was better. Entertainment, this happens. There are people that when new movies come out in the summer, there are people that have lines longer than the ones for passports for Hajj. Waiting outside to watch the next movie. I remember back in the day there was when Star Wars was coming out. People were dressed in Jedi outfits, man. Outside the... You know, they're like in their own ihram outside waiting for... The gates to Jannah to open. And they go and they watch. 
And they come out and they're like, ah, the special effects were kind of cheap. I didn't like the plot. It was kind of lame. Boo. You desired it so much and over, in no time it became worthless to you. Then those of you that wanted to get a nice car, maybe you've been looking at the Acura NSX, I don't know. Maybe you've been looking at the M3 or something. And you get the car. And it is sweet, man. You drive a little extra slow outside your school. You know? You go to the car wash a little too many times. But then the next year's model came out. And the headlights went from here to here. And your car looks so ugly all of a sudden. It is so irrelevant on the road. It makes you angry to be in this car now. It became worthless to you. This happens to our adults in their homes. They get, you know, I, um, 50 seconds, oh my God. They buy a house. Anybody who comes to the house, you give them a full tour. You even show them the boiler room. This is our bathroom. This is our second bathroom. This is our third bathroom. Nobody wants to see your bathroom. Unless, you know, okay. But anyway, no one wants to see your bathroom. But you give them a full tour. Because it's a new house. You're so excited. Two years go by, three years go by, somebody invites you to their housewarming party. It's in a nicer neighborhood. It's a bigger house. It's newer. They have nicer bathrooms too. And what starts happening? Oh my God. Your house just turned yellow. You see what I mean? I'm saying? The toy turns yellow. The car turns yellow. Some people's marriages turn yellow. The first day you got married, how excited were you to see your wife? Don't tell me. <laughs> it's having flashbacks. It's just calm down. Okay. <laughs> Ten years go by and you come home. The day you came home and saw your wife for the first time, you went to work for the first time and came home and saw your wife for the first time is a different feeling. Ten years later, you come home and you look at her and she looks at you. And it's beautiful, just like the first day. No, it's not. <laughs> Something's turning yellow. I often tell the story that you're walking with your wife, like the week you got married, you're walking with your wife and she trips. Brand new wife. She tripped. What do you do? Oh, oh, are you okay? Are you all right? I don't want anything ever to happen to you. Then 10 years go by and you're walking down the same street and she trips again. You keep on walking. <laughs> and then you keep on going, you turn back and you say, pick yourself up, woman. I can't even take you in public nowadays. What is wrong with you? Anyway, so marriages can start turning yellow. No, not that one. But Allah Azza wa tells us that all of the things that we want so badly will become of, will start losing interest in them. And then he says in the concluding remarks of this ayah, وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ عَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانٌ And at the very end is either eternal, intense punishment. That is the only thing that won't, you won't get used to. The punishment of Jahannam is not something anybody will ever get used to. The desires of this world and even the pain of this world you can get used to. But that desire and that pain you will not get used to. And then he says, وَمَغْفِرَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ And forgiveness from Allah, meaning that is permanent. And then finally he adds, وَرِضْوَانٌ And he did not say, in his eloquence, he did not say, وَرِضْوَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ He just said, وَرِضْوَانٌ Which means incredible contentment. You will finally be satisfied. You will not look for the next thing. In this world, I don't care if it's Superman or Iron Man or whatever movie you want to watch, you will come out of it waiting for the next one. You will not come out satisfied. Sorry. Sorry, it says, please stop in red. I really got to stop. Right. Okay, I promise I'm stopping next time. This, this, this did turn out to be Imam Siraj Wahaj's five minutes. <laughs> Sorry. I love him too much. I got to follow in his footsteps. Anyway. That you will have contentment. You will be at peace. Finally, in Jannah, we will be at peace. You're not going to be at peace here. We're always going to be looking for the next thing until dirt fills our stomachs. Until that happens. And so Allah says, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ One ayah, just one ayah of Surah Al-Hadid. What is worldly life? It amounts to nothing but means by which people get deceived. People think they will find happiness and they don't. 
People think they'll love their new big giant house. When they're 90 years old and their kids have moved out, that house is adab for them. It's not a joy for them anymore. Young people go to that house and say, I wish I could live here. And old people living in that house say, I wish I could get rid of this thing. I don't want to be here. Subhanallah. May Allah Azza wa Jal help us recognize what true happiness, what it really means. And may He help us materialize that true happiness through real faith in Him and through real expectations from Allah Azza wa Jal. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.